Heals welcomes you to the third Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Heals is the largest non-governmental organization in Europe promoting and advocating scientific research into longevity and biogerontology. Thanks to generous support from our sponsors, Heals was able to organize this conference. The conference will highlight the cutting edge of knowledge in the field of biogerontology and provide a unique opportunity for researchers, government officials, biotech executives and advocates from around the world to meet, network and forge new scientific collaborations. I'd like to thank um, Heels for organizing a meeting that's configured in this way, which is relatively unusual. Uh, most of the meetings that I go to are, are, are aging meetings, which are uh, almost exclusively academics, academic scientists. Um, and I do think in this area, the, the biology of aging, there's such an um, urgency to translate what we're learning about the biology of aging to human applications and human benefits. And I, I sometimes think you know, us academics, we tend to be sometimes overly preoccupied with getting high-impact high, public, high papers out and getting our next grant and so on, rather than um, doing things that are really of benefit to people. So in this um, talk today, I'm going to um, talk quite a lot at a sort of a very general level um, about aging. Um, and what aging is and um, what, uh, how things have changed in recent years in terms of ideas about aging. But then I want to, um, I do want to in some ways use this as a preamble to introduce some new work that I've done, mostly unpublished work on aging in C. elegans that I'm um, excited about, involving a new way of, of studying aging, a new way of thinking about aging in C. elegans. Um, and at the end I'll, um, I'll continue with some other sort of grand ideas about, about aging. <clears throat> so, um, you know, aging is something that, of course, we all, we all recognize it. Everybody can recognize it. Every child can see uh, when an, a person or, or a, you know, even animals um, are, are aging. But um, these external uh, signs of aging, the gray hair and wrinkling, wrinkled skin and so on, are really not what's important about aging, um, which is that aging is... Um, uh, brings with it a mass of pathologies. Uh, this is just a few, a tiny number of, of, the, of the different kinds of uh, illnesses that um, occur as, as with the process of, um, of senescence. Um, and um, senescence is something which has really uh, not been solved. It's not understood by science. I think we, we, there are many different ideas about what aging is, and I think uh, at the meeting here we've heard a number of, of, of different ideas uh, for example, advanced glycation end products and, and ROS and, and, and so on. But um, really, I think the field is, in terms of our, understa our understanding of aging, remains very fragmentary. And in a way, I think we lack a mature understanding of this phenomenon, which is really the main cause of disease and death in the world today. So this is a big uh, problem. But it's a very, very difficult one. It's really um, the, comp the sheer complexity of, of, of aging and senescence has really thus far, in a way, defeated science. And so the strategy that, uh, of my lab and you know, a number of others is to say, well, what if we were to take an organism which is really, really simple, an animal, you know, which has the fun basic features of, of, of animals, it has a nervous system, it has an excretory system, it has a digestive system, reproductive system, and so on. And it also shows aging. If we could attain a deep understanding of aging, a, a sort of full understanding of aging in a simple creature like this, though it might be quite different in, in many ways from, from mammals, that ought to be a start. And I think this is an important goal and one that I think we haven't, we haven't got there yet. But I, I think this is what my work is, is dedicated to doing. Um, and so understanding C. elegans, of course, is not because we give a damn about nematodes, but because it could tell us about an organism that we care about. <clears throat> so um, in some ways, the, the C. elegans as a, as a model for aging has been very successful, 
particularly in terms of the genetics of ageing. I say that um, we don't really understand ageing well, but one thing we know very well about ageing is, and you can see that here from the different, different lifespans of, uh, of these different mammals here, um, is that it's controlled by genes to a large extent. So the, the different organisms, different animals have very, very different lifespans. It has to be, to a large extent, controlled by genes. So uh, if it's a trait controlled by genes, that's, the, that's geneticists' uh, work. So can you do genetics on aging and lifespan? Um, so the approach that was developed in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, really was, um, was to use classical genetics to study aging. The idea is if you could find a mutant, uh, a mutant worm where you had changed the gene and you'd seen a, a, a big change uh, in lifespan, an increase in lifespan particularly, you could then find out what the gene was that had been altered and that should lead you to proteins um, that control gene products that control lifespan. And the identity, the idea was that the identity of those gene products would give a, a, an idea about what aging is. So this approach um, has, has been really very fruitful. And in C. elegans, uh, and along with other model organisms, um, many mutants have been found, many genes have been found, where you, you alter the gene function, you get a big increase in lifespan. Here's a gene called DAF2, uh, whose longevity effects were found by Cynthia Kenyon. And you can see these effects are, these are really big increases in lifespan. So this is a, showing you on the y-axis the uh, percentage of a population that's alive. Uh, you can see they're all alive at the beginning. And then over, this is time on the x-axis. You can see over time, these are wild-type worms. They start to die out. And then here are the mutant worms living much longer. And uh, I can't resist showing you this, this uh, slide here. This is from a group in Arkansas, from Bob Schmuckner-Reese's lab. And this shows... Um, this is a mutant called, it's a, in a gene called age one. And here are the wild type uh, worms. I don't know if you can see my, my slide, my uh, pointer here. And these are, the, these are two mutant populations of age one worms. And they're living 10 times longer than wild type. So these worms here are on the edge here. If these were human beings, they would be over a thousand years old. So it's incredible how plastic aging is in C. elegans. So this, this has got to be interesting. If we understand, um, what biology is, is, is doing this, you know, what's happened to these worms. This has got to be interesting to, to us. So um, the idea of doing the genetics is that you find the gene products. So what sort of genes, uh, what kind of gene products are affecting aging? And studying mutants like DAF2 and age one has led to um, the identification of, a, of a, a whole network of genes that have very profound effects on lifespan. And this figure here, you can't see it very well, but this is um, here, this is, this is a pathway of genes um, in the worm, and this is the equivalent set of genes in humans. And this, uh, this is the um, insulin IGF signaling pathway that controls, um, it's involved with insulin sensitivity and, and also growth particularly. Uh, and also a, a pathway called the TOR pathway, which is, stands for target of rapamycin. These have profound effects on aging. All oh, right. But um, does it have a clicker that can oh. attach to the... No. Oh, I'll use my finger. It's probably easier. Um, so we've found these pathways that, that control aging. And these pathways include uh, drug targets that you can use to slow aging down, like, uh, like TOR, which uh, you can inhibit with the drug rapamycin. And you can see extensions of lifespan uh, that's, um, that's been shown in worms and flies and in mice. And it's being tested in, in dogs at the moment. But um, what I'm going to talk about today is something different, which is really, what is aging, though? What does this pathway tell us? Because that was the idea, to, to discover what aging is and to have a real understanding of aging. And I think, you know, when I first came into the field, it was not long after that, that these genes were cloned. Um, and that was 20 years ago. And they, it's still not clear how these genes actually affect aging. It's not clear what their output is. This has sort of defeated people working in this area. Um, as a, just a, as an exercise just before my talk, I checked in PubMed, the pu publication 
database for papers that mention elegans and aging in their title or abstract. And it comes, came back with 2,688 hits. It's an incredible uh, number of papers. But we still don't really know what aging is. So um, <clears throat> I haven't read all these papers, by the way. But who knows, maybe the answer is somewhere in, in among this lot. But, but um, you know, it, 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 I actually feel at this point, I, I, thought that, I would have thought that by now, if I look back 20 years, by now I would be able to say that I, we understood what aging is in worms. In a way, I feel like, I feel like a failure. I feel like something's going wrong. Um, and this is really what has been a preoccupation of mine in the lab for the last five years in particular, um, that there's something wrong with our whole way of looking at aging, and we need to look at it in a different way to get around this. The, the sort of, the, the, we seem to be in a, sort of stuck in a holding pattern. So what I'd, I think there are a number of things that, um, that I, I think could be the problem, but I'm going to talk about one in particular, which has to do uh, with what I call the damage maintenance model and its insufficiency for understanding aging, uh, particularly in worms, or at least in worms. And as a solution, I'm going to present um, a theory, which is an alternative theory, um, which uh, I've been testing in the worm and I think has been want to hopefully convince you that this model is looking really good. It's, it's actually yielding real insight in the way that the damage maintenance model wasn't. So let's talk about the damage and maintenance. So, um, so this is all about what actually happens during aging. What actually goes wrong? Here's Charles Darwin. And you can see that he changes. You know, wh what's happened to him here? You know, when he goes from here to here, what, what's gone wrong with him? So one can sort of make basic um, assumptions about this. So obviously here, you, early on, you have development here. Um, and then there's some sort of cumulative changes happening during adulthood, which gives rise to pathology. And those pathologies uh, generate illnesses, aging-associated illnesses, uh, and they eventually kill uh, the person. So the question really is, what is the nature of these cumulative changes? What are these changes that give rise to the illnesses, how do they give rise to illness? Um, so when science starts to address a question, very often the starting point is common sense. Okay? So um, the co most common sense sort of explanation is that you know, complex structures, uh, they, over time, they tend to wear out. They tend to kind of break down through use. So here's a car, you see, old dead car. You can see the uh, metal uh, oxidation, the rusting, and the metal fatigue, and the mechanical injury. And here's a building uh, sort of crumbling. You can see um, damage to the building. So um, an idea that, that took deep root within the biology of aging was that, well, maybe living organisms are the same. They, they accumulate damage. And maybe this accumulated damage is the cause of aging. Um, and there are actually many theories that uh, of aging, many different theories that are sort of part of this general category of theories, um, which belong to what I, you could call the uh, standard aging paradigm. And that goes like this. You start off in a youthful state, and then you accumulate damage, just like, a, like an old car, uh, and then you become senescent. And then that's where the pathologies come from. Uh, and um, fortunately, the damage... Uh, uh, um, is not um, inexorable because you have various systems within the body of maintenance, of somatic maintenance, that can uh, reduce or even repair damage. So you can, that could be through detoxifying the causes of damage, repairing the damage, or replacing the damaged parts. Um, and uh, one of, there are various different ideas about the causes of of molecular damage. One of the most influential ones, the oxidative damage theory, you had a great uh, introduction to this from uh, Alberto Sanz earlier today. Um, and uh, so the idea here was that particularly uh, superoxide free radicals uh, produced as a byproduct of my mitochondrial respiration uh, caused damage. And when I came into the field, uh, I gathered from my colleagues that this was pretty much a done deal, this theory. It was pretty much proven. Um, it took me a while to realize that it was actually a hypothesis. Um, so, um, so thinking about the 
insulin IGF pathway and the TOR pathway and so on, I think a lot of people, here's the, the sort of somebody thinking here in the corner, uh, a lot of people kind of, uh, when they're trying to think about how these pathways might work to produce these big effects on aging, they often have this in mind, uh, that maybe um, you have this balance between your random stochastic molecular damage uh, that's promoting aging and the cellular maintenance processes which are inadequate uh, to actually prevent it. And then with these um, interventions that extend lifespan, like reducing the insulin IGF signaling or, or dietary restriction, for example, they will be uh, uh, boosting the cellular maintenance processes and reducing the stochastic uh, damage and so tipping the balance towards longevity. So um, I guess over the years I've sort of grown a bit disenchanted with the model and, and I worry about it. Um, and one of the reasons is just because I think that in terms of understanding what these pathways are doing, um, there hasn't been a great deal of movement, I would, I would argue, over the, next, over the last decade. People are doing a lot of genetics, but how exactly these genes are affecting lifespan remains rather unclear. Um, and that, I think, could be a, a sort of red flag that there's something wrong with the way we're thinking about things. And I think um, a real question is, the extent, is, is how important molecular damage is to aging. Um, molecular damage has to play some role in aging, there's no doubt at all. Uh, I'll just take as, as an example um, cancer, which you, you generally don't get without um, DNA damage. But is it, is it possible that there's something, some other things going on that we're missing, which are a major part of aging? Um, again, Alberto talked about this earlier. There was a sort of a crisis in the oxidative damage theory, um, and the field changed quite a bit. I think people quickly forget how predominant this theory was. But particularly at the end of the last decade, a, a consensus emerged that, that, that the original version of the theory is not really not right. So the question is, it, it, you know, where does this leave the, the broader molecular damage theory? One possibility is that other kinds of molecular damage are important, but ROS is not important. Um, but, uh, oh yeah, this, again, Alberto kind of covered this. These were the reasons why people were, uh, reason for doubting the, the oxidative damage theory. I think I don't need to go over this again. Um, so the question is, is it, is it that the theory sort of needs reforming? Is it that it's other kinds of damage? Or is it possible? I think one has to kind of consider this, that all these years the field has, as it were, been barking up the wrong tree, uh, particularly for C. elegans in, in um, viewing aging in this way. So one of the, you know, I found this a hard idea to consider, partly because I couldn't really think of what the alternative was. This is really the main paradigm within the aging field. Um, and I think, I do think that um, in the last few years, there's been a kind of a, a slightly anti-theory fashion within the biogerontology. I think, I think there's the certainly theories of aging used to be more fashionable when I first came into the field. Um, but I would reject this. I, th I think that um, theories are, are important. If, if there's a problem with theories, we don't have the right theory. And to say theories are bad, it's like, as you say, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So uh, if, if theories of aging are unfashionable, I'm going to be unfashionable and present more theories. <clears throat> so here's a great theory. This is uh, uh, the, the antagonistic pleiotropy theory from George Williams. Um, and this is an evolutionary theory, uh, which uh, argues that um, aging evolves um, as a byproduct of natural selection, uh, which favors um, alleles that are beneficial during youth, but it doesn't care, natural selection, evolution doesn't care about what genes are doing after you've reproduced. There's, there's a reduction in selective pressure um, against uh, alleles with deleterious effects in late life. So one of the, th what, what Williams' theory, this is a very established theory and it's very well uh, validated experimentally, <clears throat> but one of the implications of the theory what the theory is, is saying is that actually the cause of aging is wild type genes. Wild type genes cause aging. So this isn't saying that damage causes aging, it's saying wild type genes cause aging. But um, what sort of wild type genes, what processes are these wild type genes um, affecting? We're sort of back 
when we started, we still don't know. We've got genes, and we don't know what they actually do. So there have been a, a, a several attempts to try to connect, as it were, the proximate and ultimate theories of aging, the theories of the how and the theories of the why. And a really famous one, it's a beautiful theory that was proposed 20 years after Williams's theory by Tom Kirkwood. Um, and the, this theory takes as an assumption that aging is caused by molecular damage. And what it argues is that it's actually costly in resource terms to maintain your soma. So what organisms do, what the natural selection does, is to optimise the investment of resources, on the one hand, into reproduction, and on the other hand, into maintenance. And to maximise your reproductive success, it doesn't do to put too much investment into maintenance. You don't waste energy, you don't waste precious resources on living longer, longer than you would do in the wild under natural conditions. So you, you put in just enough resources to live up to the point where you reproduce, and no more. So he called this the, uh, the disposable soma model. So it's like a throwaway body. But um, this, uh, there have been a lot of, a lot of um, efforts to try to validate this theory experimentally, and it hasn't really, they haven't really been successful. And again, if there are issues with the molecular damage theory, then the disposable soma theory can't be correct. So a new theory, another theory, 30 years after the disposable soma theory, came a, um, another theory, which in a way, this is from Misha Blagoskloni. Um, and this really, in a way, goes back to uh, Williams's theory and, and uh, develops it a little more. And uh, Blagoskloni argues that, yes, molecular damage happens during aging, yes, but it's not the main cause of the pathologies that actually limit life. So what he argues is that, um, that what, it, what actually is causing it is action or run-on of wild-type genes in late life that's causing pathology. So he's arguing that it's not a loss of function, it's not like a machine model where the organism breaks down, it's actually, it's actually, it's an, it's not, gain of function isn't the right word, it's not a loss of function but it's too much function, we call it hyperfunction, that's actually causing uh, late life pathology. And he argues uh, that, um, that this gene action, and this is really coming straight from Williams, this action is programmed genetically. It's programmed by your genes. You're programmed to age. Uh, but in terms of programming can also imply adaptation. And in terms of fitness, it's not promoting it. It's not, uh, an ad it's not programmed. So he says it's quasi-programmed. Okay? So programmed in the genetic sense, not programmed in the sense of an adaptation, quasi-programmed. Uh, to sort of, his, his sort of illustrating his, his idea of quasi-program. And I'll, co I'll come back, you'll see why later, why I'm emphasizing this point. This is from his paper in Cell Cycle from 2007. If you left the water running after taking a bath, then a program for filling the bathtub would become a quasi-program to flood your apartment. Um, so this, is, um, this type of mechanism um, has been discussed a little in, in some of the older worm literature. Um, and it's what's sometimes called a tap-left-on mechanism, or uh, the Americans call it an open faucet mechanism. So it's kind of a futile run-on. It's like somebody leaves the tap on. The gene just keeps doing its thing, and it has pathological consequences. Um, and as uh, uh, Blagoskloni points out, um, there's a lot of evidence lately for the role of overactivity, for example, of the TOR pathway, in generating a number of, or contributing to a number of, pathologies of aging. And one thing to note, so here we have this sort of hyperfunction here uh, uh, over time. So you start off with your program, then you shift to your quasi-program. The pathologies develop. And one thing to note is the damage in Blagoskloni's uh, model. He argues that, um, that most of the damage that you see, molecular damage, is actually a consequence of the pathologies that accumulate during aging, not uh, the, uh, the cause. So in, in a sort of putting it in a nutshell, <coughs> this, uh, this is a sort of a, this is a, a, a approximate ultimate model, an evolutionary mechanistic model. Uh, you have your kind of first phase of life, which is adaptive, including development that leads you up to reproductive adulthood. And then you have the second stage, which is a kind of continuation of gene function, where you have development of the pathologies, which is futile, non-adaptive. 
um, and that's, that's aging. So wild type gene action is promoting fitness in early life and promoting senescence in later life. And what I would argue is, is um, certainly from based on the work um, that we're doing with C. elegans, is that insulin and IGF signaling particularly is promoting both types of development. So that's what these pathways are. This, that's why these pathways are affecting aging, because they don't just promote development, they also promote the development of pathologies. So if you starve the growth of pathologies, you reduce senescent, um, senescent pathologies and external lifespan. So this has given us, uh, finally getting to the, some, the new work on worms. Um, uh, uh, this has led us to a new way of thinking about aging, and a new kind of approach to aging. So this is how you, how you would understand aging. Um, what you need to do is you need to characterize the pathologies and understand where the pathologies have come from. And what the model is saying is that, is that the pathologies are generated by quasi-programs, which are run on of developmental processes. So in C. elegans, we have masses and masses of information about developmental biology and developmental programs. Uh, but we have very little information about pathology. So what we have to do is describe the pathology and try to understand how it can develop uh, from quasi-programs. And we also have a lot of information about genes and pathways that control aging, and we can see how they're affecting um, these, um, these quasi-programs. Something else which I think is really important, which I'm not, not going to talk about because of, uh, it would take too long, is uh, the last thing that happens, which is that the pathologies cause organismal death. And this is something which has not been studied at all uh, in C. elegans. We published a paper a couple of years ago about um, death fluorescence and organismal death in C. elegans. And we have a new study coming up in, about this. But this is a, it's, a, it's a sort of a blind spot in the biology of aging is what exactly are the events that happen during organismal death and how is organismal death triggered? So kind of at the heart of this idea is that understanding aging and, and you know, understanding lifespan um, means understanding the pathologies that the worms are dying of. Worms die of old age because of pathology. So to understand aging fundamentally, it's not so much about lifespan, it's actually really about understanding the mechanisms that cause the development of the senescent pathologies. That's the heart of, of aging. So this is what I call a pathology-centered approach to understanding aging and involves a, a sort of a new kind of approach which we call developmental pathology. It's the study of the development of pathologies which is just, they haven't been studied in Cielagans. So I'm going to give you four examples of major senescent pathologies in Cielagans um, and how we can provide uh, explanations for where they come from in terms of quasi-programs that have nothing to do with damage. So these pathologies particularly affect this structure. This is the gonad of the worm. Okay? So this is a hermaphrodite. Uh, you can see it's this long, long tube here. And here we've got a lot of mitotic germ cells here, and now they're undergoing meiosis. And then here they're forming oocytes. Can you see, you see the nuclei here? And then here is a, is a little sort of bag called the spermatheca. And here the sperm wait, and the oocytes go through here. They get fertilized. And here we have fertilized eggs in the uterus here. And then here's an egg that's popped out through the vulva here. <coughs> So the first pathology I'm going to talk about um, is um, the uterine tumour. And these are great big tumours that um, have extraordinarily been very little studied in C. elegans. You can see how big they are. You can see the tumour. This is, gives you, that's a sort of a medium to large sized tumour studied by uh, Yuan Zhao in my lab. So where do these tumours come from? So what happens is that the, the worms have a limited quantity supply of sperm and they use it all up, and then once the sperm is depleted, um, then something kind of uh, uh, unhealthy happens, which is that the unfertilized oocyte gets ovulated into the uterus. Um, and then those, um, those unfertilized oocytes, they go really weird. They start to attempt to undergo embryogenesis, um, but because they, they don't have... Um, centromeres, they start, to, um, they start to endoreduplicate and they become hypertrophic and then you end up with these tumours. 
And these tumours are suppressed when you reduce insulin IGF signaling. Uh, interestingly, this particular pathology has no effect on mortality. So you can block it and you can block the tumours and the worms don't live longer, presumably because the worms die from something else. Okay, so what they, you know, it illustrates the fact that, um, that not all pathologies uh, are life-limiting, senescent pathologies are life-limiting. As it, as it happens, the sort of worms closest thing to cancer, they don't die from that. So here's a cartoon of this. I think this is very illustrative of the, the program, quasi-program idea. So this is the gonad in a cartoon sense. So if you note here the unfertilized oocytes here and the spermatheca and the, fertilized and the embryos here. So these sperm, after a bit, they run out. Okay? And then you end up with a situation like this, where the sperm have run out, so the, uh, the, 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 the rate of ovulation goes down, and then you start to stack up all these extra oocytes. The, the gonad keeps making them, and you get extra oocytes, and then you get oocytes in the uterus. Um, which is kind of, if you like, abnormal. And then it's these oocytes that grow massive. Um, so here you have a situation where you've got no pathology. Here you've clearly got a gross pathology. But what's interesting is here, because here you have uh, what is really a pre-pathology. And you can, you can kind of conceptually mark where aging begins, where, quasi, where the quasi-program begins at the very moment when the last sperm is used up and the first oocyte is ovulated into the uterus, from that moment you're looking at abnormal biology, biology that has not been, is not really the result of, um, of selection for adaptation. Um, I just want to sh show a couple more pictures of these tumours there because they're so understudied. So you can see here's a big tumour you can see with the ends marked by the arrows. And this is the tumour stained with a, a DNA uh, uh, staining dye, DAPI. And you can see that there's these, there are these great big DNA masses resulting from um, endoreduplication, which is something that you see in, uh, in some kinds of cancers in mammals. And here you can see this is the same tumour with a, a, a fluorescently tagged histone, you can see, which coats these, these chromatin masses. So these are tumour-like structures which presumably form from pure hyperfunction. So they're not uh, forming from, da from uh, mutation. So this would be slightly analogous to something like um, benign prostatic hyperplasia, where you get a sort of tumour essentially in your prostate, which is not actually caused by, uh, by mutation. And uh, now I'm going to see if this movie will work. <coughs> Let's give it a try. This is a, this is a movie that uh, was made recently by a student in my lab. Is it going to work? Yeah, OK. So this is... Um, this was made using spin microscopy, which is selective plane illumination microscopy. And this shows you um, the, the nuclei. Oh, well, it's a bit light in here, but you can sort of see here at the top, you see these green spots? Those are the hypertrophic nuclei in the, uh, in the, in the um, uterine tumour inside there. And that's, uh, the red is a, is a cell surface marker. It just gives you a picture of what these tumours look like. You, I think you can see pretty much from there from that picture what they are. All right, so that's a, a pathology which I think is almost certainly attributable to run-on. Here's another pathology, very severe. This is work from Yila de la Guardia <coughs> in my lab. And this affects the, uh, the gonad. So here you can see, uh, this is the same structure again. Here if in pink, I've highlighted the, uh, the distal arm of the gonad on a day one animal. And here's a day 12 animal. And you can see that the gonad has completely shriveled down and fragmented, actually. This is a piece of gonad here. So the gonads just shrivel up and disappear. So where has the gonad gone? Um, so again, we, we played the same sort of strategy and we looked at normal physiological function to see what, what normal processes cause a loss of uh, gonad biomass. And there is such a process. And so um, if you look at the gonad here, you can see we've got big cells here and then very small cells here. So how do we go from the small cells, loads of small cells, to a small number of big cells? That's possible because most of those cells undergo apoptosis. Uh, and this is not damage-induced apoptosis. This is so-called physiological apoptosis. And what it does is to, is to generate cytoplasm, which is used for sort of pumping up these oocytes. Uh, so they're rather sort of analogous to nurse cells in, in higher animals. 
Um, so what Yela found was that the physiological apoptosis continues at a very high rate. Um, and she found that if you block the uh, physiological apoptosis, you block this atrophy. Not entirely, but you decelerate it a great deal. And if you accelerate the rate of, uh, of, of physiological apoptosis, you actually accelerate the rate of, of atrophy. So what that uh, work supported was the view that um, essentially you have a kind of open faucet, an open, a left on, tap left on um, of apoptosis, uh, which is causing the, uh, uh, the loss of biomass in that um, organ. So here's, a, here's an even a simpler example of a tap left on, which, is, um, which Marina Oscura in my lab is working on. So the intestine of the worm is the source of yolk, uh, which provisions the oocytes. Okay? So the intestines make loads of yolk, and then they secrete it into the body cavity of the worm, um, and then it goes into the oocytes. So what happens when the oocytes when the sperm run out and the oocyte production goes down, what happens is actually the intestine just continues to make yolk in an uncontrolled way. Um, and the worm body cavity completely fills up with these uh, lipid-rich yolky pools. Um, and so um, this is uh, another example of, a, of an open, of a tap left on. So, of course, um, the, the argument here would be that the evolutionary theory would argue that why would natural selection produce a mechanism to turn this yolk production off because these animals are post-reproductive. There would be no benefit for them to turn it off. And so this is a, almost a sort of, okay, so this is, um, it, it looks like a very much a form of senescent obesity in, in C. elegans. And again, in the long-lived insulin IGF mutants, the tap is switched off. They don't accumulate the yolk and they don't accumulate these pools. And if you genetically block the yolky pool accumulation, you can increase the worm lifespan. So I think this um, example is particularly close to the Blagoscolonia's bath model, you know, the overflowing bath, uh, or, or a quasi, uh, to illustrate how a program becomes a quasi-program. So this, I'm sure you would all agree, this is not caused by damage. What's causing this pathology to develop? It's simply continuation of wild-type gene function, just as described in uh, Williams' original paper. But this is, I think, this is my favorite example. This is a more sort of recent um, uh, understanding that we've come to. This is work from Anne Gilliatt and Alex Benedetto. So one of the most uh, sort of shocking pathologies in the worm affects the main somatic organ of the worm, which is the intestine. Uh, and you can see here, this, uh, this is this, the intestine here, you can see it fills the whole body cavity of the worm here. It's a, it's a huge organ uh, for the worm, and it also serves the function of a adipose tissue and liver. Uh, and this is a day one worm, and here is a day 14 worm. Now I'm, I'm gonna use the other, oh, it's not here. Uh, so this, um, if you look here, that there is all that's left of the, of the cytoplasm of the intestine. This is all just empty space. So there is a massive atrophy of this main organ um, and there are uh, strong reasons for believing that probably it's pathology of the intestine which is limiting life in C. elegans. For example, if you do intestine-specific interventions in insulin and just signaling, you can get extension of lifespan. So it seems to be that it's the intestine which is the main organ that's sort of life-limiting. Um, so, uh, so yes, you get this massive decrease in, in intestinal size. So the question is, what's causing this atrophy? Is it damage, or could it be some sort of run-on? Um, and this was, uh, this is a sort of, here's developmental pathology data. So this shows the age in adulthood on the x-axis, and this is two pathologies. Uh, and what we have here is the intestinal size getting smaller, and here are the yolk pools getting bigger. So uh, we looked at these figures, and... Uh, it took a while for the penny to drop, really, and I remember sitting with Anne and saying, well, where is all, the, um, where is all this biomass going? Where does it all go? And then you look at it and you think, well, this is going down and this is going up. Maybe what's happening is that the biomass is moving from one to the other. So this led us to our hypothesis, which we call the gut-to-yolk intestinal biomass conversion hypothesis. 
Uh, remember that the gut is where the yolk is made, and the worms make massive amounts of yolk. So it's, it seemed plausible. Um, and we found a number of um, lines of evidence that support this hypothesis. So, for example, you see a strong correlation between the two pathologies, if you look at individual worms. The worms with the smaller guts, they have more yolk. If you block yolk synthesis, uh, it inhibits atrophy. Um, but uh, some of the best data came from reasoning that if the biomass combustion is happening, that autophagy is very likely to play a role in breaking down the cells to, to release uh, mat raw materials for yolk production. So we tried blocking autophagy using a number of different means, and it, it uh, strongly blocks the atrophy, and it blocks yolk accumulation. There's a bit of Alex's data there. So this is um, looking at yolk pool accumulation. This is wild-type worms, and this is uh, ATG13, an autophagy-deficient mutant. You see how the yolk accumulation is less? But here, this is, this is slightly better, because here he's done RNAi knocking out autophagy in the intestine alone, and that's sufficient to, uh, to reduce the... Uh, uh, so it's sufficient to reduce the yolk accumulation. So, and, and, and here is gut atrophy. So this is gut atrophy in, uh, in uh, normal worms, and these are in either knockout, autophagy knockout worms, or worms with autophagy knocked out in the intestine alone. Uh, and there you can see there's a, a, a worm with a control worm and a worm with autophagy knocked out in the, in the gut. So we have, apparently, another open tap of biomass conversion. So again, this mechanism is not, apparently not a damage mechanism, but a, um, a run-on mechanism. So here's a summary of the model. So we have autophagy-dependent breakdown of in intestinal biomass, and that's promoting this senescent atrophy of the intestine um, through, and then the, thanks to biomass conversion, that supports production of yolk protein, uh, yolk lipid synthesis we don't know, but that produces the yolky pools and this senescent obesity, contributing to mortality. Um, but the effects of knocking these down are not huge, so presumably there are other, other senescent pathologies. But um, I think what I find particularly interesting is that the insulin pathway, working through this longevity transcription factor, DAF16, um, is regulating this whole process. So DAF2 is actually driving the process. It's actually activating autophagy. You take away DAF2, and the DAF16 is switching autophagy off, switching off vitilogenin synthesis, and so um, acting against senescent pathology. So we actually have a mechanism for, um, for at least partly how, these, how this pathway is actually having its effects on aging. And that, I think, is the beginning of a... Comp it's a full explanation mechanistically. It doesn't require reference to some other unknown processes downstream or whatever. And here on the right, we have the evolutionary theory. This is Williams' theory. We've got uh, the DAF2 pathway promoting fitness in early life and then run-on of the process promoting pathology in later life. So here we have a case potentially where we can understand um, how, uh, in how antagonistic pleiotry was actually enacted in terms of uh, actual processes that affect senescent uh, pathology. So... I'm almost at the end of this section. Um, so I'd like to just add something to try to convince you of something I'm trying to, I'm trying to convince myself, which is that th what we learn about pathology from worms could be relevant in some way to understanding pathologies uh, of aging in, in humans. And my contention is, is, that, is that in some way, C. elegans is like a very distant mirror and if you understand of, of, of pathology of, of, of aging in higher animals. So if you really study it, you'll see some things that are universal. And I think this could be an example. So this is a sort of formalization of this biomass conversion mechanism, okay? So we have here the gut, which is a kind of source, I'm going to call it the source organ. And the source organ, because of biomass conversion, undergoes atrophy. And it's releasing yolk, which is going to a destination or uh, organ or place uh, are generating another kind of pathology, okay? Actually, if you look at worms, there are other kinds of destination pathologies that you see. For example, um, the yolk actually stimulates uterine tumor growth. So if you block yolk production, you get smaller tumors. 
And also you see ectopic deposition of yolk within muscle, rather reminiscent of uh, ectopic deposition of fat in aging muscle in, in humans. But I think um, a parallel that I find rather fascinating uh, relates to another, this is another female uh, 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 biology uh, akin to yolk, but instead of yolk, it's milk. Milk, which is a rather similar sort of substance to yolk. And during lactation in, in mammals from mice up to humans, uh, you get erosion of bone in order to release calcium for milk to feed your offspring. And that can lead to osteoporosis. And there's some evidence that, um, that, that the, one of the reasons why women are prone to osteoporosis is, is menopausal women, you get some reactivation of this mechanism in later life. So you get bone-to-milk bone to biomass conversion, but also you get these destination effects because the calcium can also end up uh, going into arteries, causing ca uh, vascular calcification and cardiovascular disease. It also goes into joint cartilage. It contributes to osteoarthritis through chondrocalcinosis. Uh, and, of course, mammary tissue itself takes up a lot of calcium, and, and in, that, in breast cancers you get microcalcification, which is a feature of breast cancer. So I think this is potentially a sort of deep... Uh, a, a sort of deep homology between um, pathogenetic mechanisms between sort of female worms and, and female mammals. So just to sort of round off this bit, so to understand aging, you have to understand the mechanisms by which late life pathologies develop, the etiologies of senescence, if you like. Looking at C. elegans, C. elegans are riddled with pathologies that are consistent with a run-on of wild-type gene function in, in late life. And these pathologies, that I've, the ones I've mentioned, they're far better explained in terms of wild-type gene run-on than uh, damage and maintenance. Um, and interestingly, in this case, autophagy, which has traditionally been seen as something protective against aging because it can get rid of damaged proteins, in this case, autophagy is playing the opposite role uh, and promoting aging. So you have a sort of paradigm shift here, if you like. Uh, the old paradigm being the sort of failure model, if you like, Aging as a result of failure, the sort of machine model, the wearing out idea, and the new paradigm, which is that we're programmed by our genes to age. And this is the pleiotropy run on model, or Williams Blagoskoni model, if you like. And that, in my lab, has lifted very, it's led to a shift in experimental approach because the, the old model focuses your attention on a, on a completely different level, a very specific level, which is biochemistry and metabolism. And so much of the, of the research in this area has focused. On, on the biochemical level, on damage, and so on. But actually, what the pleiotropy model is saying, that aging is more like a developmental problem. So the kind of methods that we're using to study these is more like developmental genetics. So hence our approach of developmental pathology, which I hope I've convinced you is, a, is being a fruitful approach. So uh, just to say one thing about sort of practical implications, thinking about how does this apply to humans? Um, I think a broad implication here is that, um, is that actually it's late life gene action which is the problem and it's that that needs to be inhibited. So to treat aging uh, based on this understanding means treating these late life gene actions that are generating pathologies and what that will achieve, what that I think is achieving in these mutants is essentially a deceleration of senescence. You're slowing down uh, starving the development of these pathologies. I think that's probably why, uh, to some extent, why these um, long-lived organisms are, are living long and staying healthier for longer. So that will give you increased youth span, health span, and, and life span. Uh, how am I doing? Well, another five minutes. So um, <clears throat> I've probably got more slides than I can, can deal with. Uh, uh, it, when I came at, uh, to the meeting, I, had this, I was very enthusiastic about telling you about these new findings about what worms die of. I'm, I'm very excited about this. We just uh, got it provisionally accepted for publication. But then I was thinking, you know, uh, maybe not everyone is as is, is, is excited about worms as I am. So I thought maybe I'd talk about something else instead, um, which is uh, some general observations about aging. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I was going to talk about two areas of confusion, but I'll mention one, the first one, which is what I call the aging disease false dichotomy. So um, looking at aging as a biologist, um, aging manifests itself, you know, senescence, if you like, as a bunch of pathologies and malfunctions. Um, it's something like a genetic disease syndrome. 
except that it's not caused by genetic, it's not caused by aberrant genes or mutations, it's actually caused by our wild type genes. But that's not what a lot of people think. That's, it seems most doctors will greatly disagree with you there. Um, and um, the traditional view, I think, is this, uh, what I would call the aging disease dichotomy. So this is a traditional view, uh, particularly within medicine. So the view it would be that aging is a natural and a universal process, and so it's not a disease, aging itself. Uh, so that means that intervening in aging is kind of an unnatural thing to do. Aging is, is not the pathological itself, but it's a risk factor for, for diseases of aging. But itself isn't pathological. It's, just a, it's a risk factor. So the, what we should aim to do, we don't want to treat aging because it's not a disease, but we should treat the diseases of aging. And so if you can do that, you end up with people who are completely healthy and then they die. Um, so... I mean, people in the audience may have very mixed views about this, but I can only see this as in wholly false. Um, and why, why does this idea come from? I've been trying to understand where this idea comes from. One of the reasons why it's so prevalent is because it's what medical students are taught. This is a, a table from a book, uh, it's an excellent book actually, called Basic Pathology. Um, and it's a list of things that happen to old people. And you can see here cardiovascular system, reduced vessel elasticity, reduced number of heart fibres, so, uh, increased size of muscle fibres, look at that respiratory system, redu reduced alveolar ventilation. So what is, these are things that are going wrong. So what is the heading of this table? Normal physiological changes with increasing age. And just to sort of drive the point home, there's this, it has this lovely cartoon, ageing is normal. Don't forget, there's nothing wrong with these people. They have problem, their bowel motility is reduced. That's normal, you know. So this idea is very, very entrenched. Um, and I learned not long ago uh, that, in fact, the origins go back to a specific point in history, which is the second century in Rome. Um, and uh, a period when there was a sort of flowering of, of thought and ideas relating to medicine, which had a lot to do with the, philo the, the stoical philosophy of the time, uh, and the fact that the emperor at the time was a hypochondriac, and, and he was, um, this was Marcus Aurelius. Um, and Galen was, was very much a protege of Marcus Aurelius, and it was Galen who came up with this notion of aging as something natural and good and normal and for the best. Actually, the pre-thinkers before Galen, uh, going back to Hippocrates and, and even Seneca, uh, wrote of aging as, as just horrible and an illness and, and a curse. And this is the book, this is Karen Cocaine's Experiencing Old Age in Ancient Rome. Um, so I would argue very strongly against this uh, aging disease dichotomy. And, I mean, for a start, biogerontology is the study of senescence. So senescence is, implies pathology. It's in the word. So healthy senescence um, is an oxymoron. It doesn't really make sense. You can sort of talk of healthy aging because you could say, well, you could, you can, aging can mean calendar aging. You know? So you could say getting older in calendar years and being healthy and healthy aging. Uh, otherwise, the name of my institute would be absurd. Um, senescence is a normal function for older people and so not pathological. Well, I mean, ubiquity is not an argument against pathology. I mean, we all get colds. It doesn't mean that colds are not diseases. Um, so, um, you know, I would argue that aging is fundamentally, it is really, you know, what defines it is this set of pathologies. So understanding aging means understanding the etiology of these pathologies. Um, and I think one of the things which is, I find very shocking in the discussions of aging is the dual standards that, that are created by this um, aging disease false dichotomy. Actually, aging is just a part of medicine. It's a disease and it's no different. And let me just give you a few examples of these dual standards, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Sometimes people say, oh, you can't treat aging because you'd have a terrible problem with population. You'd use up all the world's resources. Well, why, why are the resources, why we have so many people in the world today? It's because of thanks to medicine, right? People live longer because of medicine, because of dealing with world hunger. You know, that's good, right? You have more people, that's great. You wouldn't argue that, you know, solving world hunger is a disaster because of population. But when it comes to aging, suddenly, it, you know, th th this is a terrible thing. But it's dual standards. 
Another idea that one, one comes across is the idea that people that actually decide they want to delay senescence are somehow egotistical and greedy. So someone says, oh, I've got cancer, you know, I, I'm, you, you know I, I want to get treated. You would say, oh, you egotistical, you know, don't be so greedy for life, you know, how long do you want to live anyway? But as soon as it's aging, then it's like, you know, it's sort of somehow unsavory to want to uh, try to prevent it. Steel standards. Similarly, there's this notion that sometimes in the literature where long-lived organisms, not only long-lived, but they're also remarkably, they're actually healthier. Well, of course they're healthier. The only reason they live longer is because they have less pathology. Aging and disease is the same thing. Um, there's also this notion that if you treat aging, you'll get sick old people who won't die. Well, the only reason, you know, if you treat aging, you treat disease. That's why people live, would live longer, because they're healthier. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an absurd idea. Um, this is what, I think one of the most ridiculous ones um, relates to this idea of um, what would happen if you got rid of disease. If, you, if, if the aging disease dichotomy is right, you get rid of all the diseases, right? So here's somebody who's aging badly. Um, and so um, here's someone who's aging well without um, pathology, okay? So she dies from aging-related disease. But the question then becomes, what does she die of? If she's sort of, she's aged, she's been freed of aging-related diseases. So the idea is that she dies from pure aging. Um, I think, you know, if someone, if someone actually has a condition that causes them to die, that's about the, 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 the most clear uh, illustration that they must have some very severe pathology. You know, the notion that you die from nothing. So using a sort of London vernacular, so it's cobblers. So, oh, I th I'm not going to go over this, just, for this. So just sort of ranting there. Um, I'm just going to go to the conclusions and... and uh, um, so, to summarise, non-pathological senescence is a fallacy. Uh, it's, senescence is a disease syndrome with multiple causes. Uh, some of the causes lead to multiple pathologies, um, but uh, you may also have causes that cause individual pathology. I didn't have a chance to go over this. So I think, in a way, an anti-aging treatment is something that prevents... Is, it just is a, it, it, it's a treatment that takes a preventative approach to pathologies of aging, whether it's broad spectrum or whether it's narrow spectrum. So by that view, a dental hygienist is, is somebody who's also an anti-aging practitioner since they're preventing aging of your teeth. I think this, I didn't talk about this, but I think this notion of treating the whole of aging based on the current science is probably unrealistic. What we can do is to hit points of intervention that protect against the broad spectrum of aging-related diseases. But I think the idea that it's, it's the whole of aging is a, is a biogerontological myth, unfortunately. And uh, avoid dual standards. So finally, um, I'll just say this question, what causes aging? This is my sort of model of aging. In some ways, I think there is no one cause of aging. And it's a bit like asking what causes disease. There's no one cause of disease. But you can make generalizations. You can say, well, disease mainly is caused by certain things, infection, mechanical injury, mutation, a few other things. So you can make very broad brush statements. In terms of aging, I think from the worm's perspective, the main cause of aging is probably wild type gene function. But damage is very important as well. Uh, molecular damage, mechanical injury, other kinds of damage are important. And I, my own feeling is that, is that where the action lies in the future is really understanding how wild type gene function produces pathology and the complex interactions between molecular, between injury and damage and, and those effects of antagonistic pleiotropy. Uh, so damage may trigger, for example, act as a trigger for producing these AP effects. And I think that's probably where a lot of work has to be done in the future. So thank you to my wonderful people in my lab. So many of them are so great and, and so talented. And, and, um, and to my collaborators, including Misha Blagoskloni, eccentric as he is, but he's very brilliant. Uh, and thank you for listening to a long talk after lunch. <laughs>
uh, that is there, that uh, is evolutionary very old, is present from invertebrates to humans, and uh, uh, it continues to, to work, so that when I started saying that uh, not all was declining, but there was something which was increasing uh, regarding uh, the immune system, all the people will say, so what? Uh, but uh, the, the inflammatory uh, theory, that uh, hypothesis that I put forward fit very well because uh, what, uh, what is uh, increasing with age is a normal function which uh, is uh, not only developmental but is uh, the, the, the core of the, the biology for, uh, for an organism to survive is uh, to identify, to sense uh, a danger and to repair the danger. So inflammation is really a, a very basic mechanism and the inflammation fits uh, very well with uh, what you were saying from a, a totally another starting point of view. All I can say is that I completely agree with that, absolutely. And you can think of all of those genes that are involved in macrophage function as George Williams' antagonistic pleiotropy genes. They're protecting you when you're young. When you're old, a lot of that is, is enormously destructive in generating pathology. Yeah. So, the, you know, that, it's a perfect illustration. Yes. But what's triggering it, maybe damage plays a role, but the, the major damage is the inflammation. Uh, really interesting talk. So just to dig in to make sure that uh, we understand uh, in this uh, example of damage being created with too much yolk and also other damage in the intestine and uh, a view that said that damage is the primary cause of aging would then want to go in and remove the yolk uh, and maybe that would help a bit but it wouldn't deal with the, con the associated damage in the intestine. So a better approach would be to say this is only damaged because there are no more sperm there. And if sperm was still there, then the original mechanisms would no longer be dysfunction but function. So is that correct, that if one wanted to stop aging in this case, you could keep the sperm going by some intervention? Yeah, we, we've actually done that experiment. If, if you take the worms and you, um, and you make them, you can make them so they have an extra, more of a sperm supply. And what that does is to delay the, the yolk accumulation. It also delays the appearance of the uterine tumors. But I, I think the... Um, in terms of sort of generalizability, I think the general principle is, is that um, either you want, to, you want to delay the switch from program to quasi-program, which in the worm is when the sperm depletion happens, but in mammals, you know, there are maybe equivalent processes where you're, you're switching from the healthy to the, to the unhealthy quasi-program. Or you simply suppress those pathways that are involved in driving the development of the pathology, so it's starting from late in life. And I think, you know, if there's a lesson in terms of principles for a, a general application to future medicine from these model <coughs> studies, it's, it's prevention, not cure. So it's preventing the pathologies from developing in the first place. And because of the nature of antagonistic biotropy, it seems like it's possible, at least to some degree, to really to do that by, by getting into the central pathways that are involved in the development of pathologies. Uh, when you have less extended lifespans of uh, the worms, would you say that you have observed any particular pathologies that are not seen in normally aging worms? For example, in humans it's not so easy to see who is 90 and who is 110 because the older people age slower somehow. Can you see any non-lethal pathology in the life extended worm that is unseen in younger? Well, I mean a simple answer is that some of the mutations that, that produce these life extending effects have pleiotropic effects. Um, but the question is, can you separate the pleiotropic effects? So some of them are highly abnormal and weird in various ways. There are some mutants, like some of the, it's a study I did years ago, I, I found some of the insulin signaling mutants, which are very, very long lived, appear to be wholly normal in free pathologies. So 
what they die of, I, I don't know. But the answer is, there are some where you don't, you seem to be able to get the benefit without anything in, in gross pathological terms uh, happening as well. Hello. Um, so, so evolution has is, is, is basically been trillions of experiments basically happening on lots of organisms to, to create a very well-coordinated dance of genetics and epigenetics, um, which is, you know, and the, the focus of evolution is obviously pre pre-reproductive age. So you have a huge amount of dysregulation that happens after reproduction. Um, and it, it just seems so, so crazily complicated, that, that area after reproduction, that would you, it kind of implies in my mind that the SENS approach of fixing areas of damage is more promising than attempting to almost reinvent the whole entire evolutionary process to try and correct epigenetic problems that, that, that happen after reproduction, you know, we, we just don't have the brain power and the understanding to be able to do that. And if we did do it, maybe we would cause problems pre-reproduction. Um, re mm. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, um, I, I mean, as I understand it, in a way, there are th I see sort of two sides of the SENS approach. So, I mean, uh, I think initially the, the SENS approach is, as I understand it, is rooted in the damage maintenance paradigm. Um, and it seemed like a some Aubrey de Grey's comments seem like a sort of logical and, and valid extrapolation from some of the things that, for example, uh, Tom Kirkwood and Michael Rose wrote some years ago. You know, if you could enhance somatic maintenance, you'd be able to essentially end senescence altogether. So I think part of the sense idea is based on the idea of, of, of enhancing maintenance. Um, the other, the, the sort of other side of the sense approach, the engineering approach, is kind of repairing when things go wrong. A bit like you were saying, sort of. You could extract the yolk out of the worms and that sort of thing. I mean, I think, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's possible in principle. I mean, I, I find this more interesting because you can actually do it. This stuff actually works. It, it, it's actually, these animals are living longer. These are drugs that, you know, like rapamycin that really are slowing aging. So, I mean, I think um, the, the sense approach seems to me like many beautiful and exciting I ideas you know, that are around like cryonics or interstellar travel and, and things like this, which will perhaps have their day at some point. But in terms of what looks realistically achievable in the, in the, in the reasonable future, uh, I think this, this type of approach of, of inhibiting pathways that are promoting uh, senescence seems, seems uh, the most promising in the short term. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, the genetics of menopause in humans is logically a key point in your argument and what's been really interesting is the GWAS studies have been very exciting two-thirds of the, I think it's about 50 variants have been discovered for human menopause and two-thirds of them are DNA repair genes and delayed menopause results in more breast cancer so that kind of model would suggest that, that you need to separate out the aging process causes DNA damage and menopause from lifespan, which is not a direct measure of aging, it's how long you live. That's a different concept from the accumulation of damage. As I say, the GWAS is suggesting that two-thirds of the genes involved in menopausal age are DNA damage yeah. genes. Well, that's very interesting. I mean, it certainly would makes it makes perfect sense because what's limiting the, the limiting factor in menopause is is the uh, stock of of of, um, of oocytes. So the better your DNA repair, the longer lasting that that population is likely to be. But uh, I mean, I take your point broadly about lifespan as a measure. It's, it's something I almost spoke about, but didn't in the end. Which I think one of the problems with the field and why the field has has stalled a little bit is because of the emphasis on lifespan as a trait. And one thing about lifespan is that, you know, lifespan is a demographic trait. It's a numerical trait. So if you have a gene function and you have a numerical trait, you can't really connect them together because one of them is just numbers. And the thing about studying pathology, if you're studying the genetics of pathology, connecting a change in a tissue with a gene function is something that you can do. There's almost, it's almost an absurdity to, to take a gene and to take lifespan and to try to functionally connect them. Because one is just, a, just numbers, right? You see what I mean? If you want to understand gene function, you have to make a connection to some sort of biological process, like a tissue, an organ, a, 
a change a pathway or something. Okay, so that's okay. Well, perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen, for this very yeah. interesting presentation. Yeah.